And welcome to Lunching on the Books, uh, or Lunching with Books. Um, I'm Eric Plunkett. I chair the committee, and uh, we're just delighted that y'all are here. Um, I've got a few announcements. First of all, I want to thank our um, volunteers today. We've got Brenda and Ron and Shirley. Y'all raise your hand. Say hi to everybody. Um, next month, in June, I'm trying to find my reading glasses, there they are, uh, we're going to have um, Marshall Ramsey, and he'll be here. He asked for a computer, and um, Marion helped Ms. Lyle helped me with that. She said, why don't you try to get uh, Marshall? So I text him, and uh, he said, absolutely. So he'll be here June. Uh, he wants a computer, Philip, and a... Uh, an overhead, not an overhead, but so he can put his cartoons up on the screen. And Mr. Holland is going to introduce him. And probably, there's probably more cartoons of Steve Holland out there than anyone else. 603. 603. It may just be the Steve Holland show. I don't know. But uh, it, it's going to be entertaining, so y'all try to make it. Um, let's see. Um, I've got a couple guests that I have to mention. Uh, i got a couple of colleagues that I work at with us from Sanctuary Hospice, Tawana O'Rea, raise your hand, and with her is Heather Palmer. Um, they didn't know I was going to embarrass them, but uh, uh, Tawana is our chief operating officer, and Heather Palmer is, uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to mention her in my story today because she plays kind of an important role in that because uh, she helped me with a couple things. But she's our um, uh, outreach and fundraising person, and she they both wear a lot of hats. They actually run the place. Um, who else do I? Oh, Kathy Haynes, who I'm going to be talking about. She's actually uh, part of the book. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about the role that she played in this book that I'm about to review. So I'm just going to jump right into it, y'all. Um, the book I'm re reviewing today is Playing for Overtime. Uh, it's the David Lee Herbert story. Can everybody hear me in the back? Um, it's a great book. I'm going to read some excerpts from it. It's... It, you think it's a, f a book about football, but it's so much more. It's about the man, it's about the town, it's about the community, it's about his faith and the things he endured and went through. And uh, I have people in the room that actually knew him, and we're gonna, I'm going to include them in the story. Uh, but it is a little bit about football. And so I'm going to just jump right into it. This is a foreword by the sports uh, writer uh, Rick Cleveland. Uh, he wrote the uh, foreword in the book, and I'm going to read a part of it. It has been my good fortune as a sports writer to cover 29 Super Bowls, several Cotton and Sugar Bowls, and other major college bowl games. Those travels, those experiences have been a blessing, and I don't take them lightly. Nevertheless, when I'm asked about my favorite sport event, to write about Super Bowls and college game never entered the conversation. In fact, I would much rather cover small town Mississippi football with Class 1A championships being my favorite game to cover. In Class 1A, whole towns turn out for the game. Players, rosters, coaching staff, and budgets are small. Players go both ways. Some players never leave the field an entire game. As a matter of fact, when I was a junior at Nettleton High School, my junior year, I never left the field. Every offensive play, every defensive play, every punt, every kickoff, never left the field. My senior year, I missed one play. They tell me I was running down the field on defense and someone hit me blindsided and knocked me out. They came over with, they used to have these little capsules that you'd break open and they were filled with ammonia. And they put that up to my nostrils and I immediately came to, I, I kind of staggered off the field. I was standing on the sideline while the next play was going on. And of course, you know, our games were all on Friday night. High school games are still that way. My coach looked at me, he said, pluck it, what day is it? And I said, Thursday. <laughs> and he kind of looked at me and he said, close enough, get back in the game. <laughs> that was a, a concussion protocol back in the, back in the 70s. But uh, small town football was like that. Um, 
You often see 150-pound guards blocking for 220-pound quarterbacks. You seldom have 22 players, so you can never do a full scrimmage. Blocking dummies serve the opposition in practice. The players and coaches never traveled to games in a chartered bus. The teams didn't have an equipment truck. Players traveled with their equipment in their lap. The schools were so small that everyone that tried out made the team. And coaches? They often serve as teacher, trainer, surrogate father, bus drivers. They wash the socks and the jocks. They mow the fields, stripe the boundary sidelines, and mop the locker room. Often, it's the head football coach, not the town mayor, that is the most well-known, most beloved, and most criticized person in town. Most 1A schools are set in small towns with populations less than 500, student bodies less than 150, typical senior graduating class maybe 20, 30, maybe 40, but small. Everyone and their cousins are at the game. Sports, especially football, gave small towns their identity. It was a major source of interest, pride, and belonging. In 1970, when integration came to many schools in North Mississippi, fall classes had just begun and there was tension and anxiety. But in addition to fall classes starting, something else was about to happen. All across the state of Mississippi, football teams were, at, were about to play the first game. And for the first time, black and white players were on the same team. Whites cheering for blacks and blacks cheering for whites. It was a remarkable time. And many par participants believed that it was football that helped bring the races together. I was talking to Will Comeyer the other day, and after I had read the book, he kind of filled me in on a couple things, and this is a quote from the book. Former WTVA TV sports director Will Comeyer said this, I was raised in Madison, Wisconsin. There were seven high schools in the area. Mine had 4,000 students, and there might be 2,000 people at a game. I remember distinctly the first game I ever went to in Mississippi. It was 1983. I'd never seen anything like it. Five to six deep all around the fence and the stands were completely packed. I realized football was special down here. After the games, that night back at the station, I told my director that three and a half minutes was not enough to cover the games. And I pushed and I pushed because he said no, but I kept pushing and the next year I got five minutes, but that still wasn't enough. And I pushed and I pushed and I kept pushing and by the third year I got 15 minutes and Friday night fever was born. It was the first high school football show in Mississippi. A lot of the small schools like Tishomingo, Biggersville, Ashland, Potts Camp, Faulkner, Smithville. Tishomingo High School used to be Class 1A, but a lot of the schools consolidated. And there's a whole chapter in the book that I don't have time to talk about, but that was the identity, these little tiny towns and these little tiny schools, that football team, and they, were, they all supported the team. And then consolidation came, which was a good thing in many cases because it did save the state money, but the downside, in many ways, these little teams lost their identity. And so a lot of those 1A schools are gone now. Um, in 1983, the new football coach, David Lee Herbert and his wife, a math teacher, and their four children began their new life to Shemingo High. Fast forward five years to 1988. And the book talks a good bit about what I'm about to mention now. I was sitting in, uh, at home in 1988 in my den watching Sunday uh, football show. It was uh, Brent Musburger on CBS, and his show was called NFL Today. And as I was eating my lunch, sitting there in the living room, I heard him mention Tishomingo High, this little school in Mississippi. And I turned to the TV and he said, y'all, this is the most fantastic, most unbelievable play I have ever seen in my life. And they showed the play. And, and I watched the TV and I was thinking, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. It was 1988, the last game of the season. There were second, oh, excuse me, seven seconds left in the game. Coach Herbert sent in a play that his team had never run, never practiced, never drawn up on a chalkboard, and by the end of the week, in the age before internet, it went viral. 
It was the last game of the season. Tishomingo was playing Faulkner. Faulkner, excuse me, Tishomingo led Faulkner by two points, 16 to 14. There's just seven seconds left in the game. Tishomingo has the ball on Faulkner's 35-yard line. And everyone was surprised when Coach Herbert called the timeout with seven seconds left. He calls a timeout. And he's, he's trying to explain to his team this play. Because everybody expected that the quarterback would go up and do the victory formation and take a knee, let the clock run out, game over. Because it was first down. But he called the timeout. And everybody in stands on both sides, visitors and home, were scratching the head. What is he doing? What is he doing? But here's the deal. To advance to the playoff, <clears throat> Tishomingo had to defeat Faulkner by four points because there was a tie. And when there's a tie, you have to go to a tiebreaker. So what they do is how many points you scored and how many uh, was scored against you. So if you scored 100 and it had 50 scored on you, that's the difference of 50. So the larger that gradient, obviously you beat those teams worse. So they had to win by four points and they were only ahead by two points. And there's only seven seconds left in the game. Nobody in the entire county of Tishomingo could kick a 52-yard field goal. So the field goal was out of the question. He could try a Hail Mary pass and throw to the end zone, but Coach Herbert's son, who was also named Dave, was starting at quarterback. He had played tight end. The quarterback got hurt, so they had to move him from tight end to quarterback. He couldn't throw it that far. So that was out of the question. During the timeout, he gave his son the play. And the play the team had never run before, practiced, or even heard of. So his son goes back out, gets in the huddle, and one of the players said, you must be crazy. <laughs> Your dad has gone crazy. As a matter of fact, the team wouldn't run the play. They had two delay of game penalties. And the people in the stands are going, what is going on? Well, they finally, reluctantly, agreed to run the play. And Dave, the son, the quarterback, gets up under center. The ball is snapped. He pitches it to the fastest player on the team, a kid named Shane Hill, and he ran the other way. Ran all the way to the other team's end zone, slid into the end zone, laying down, and one of the referees did this, and the other referee did this. And the one that did this looked at the other uh, referee and said, you're right, it's this. That's a safety. It's worth two points. So now what's the score of the game? 16 to 16. It's a tie, and the clock has run out. He brings his team inside. He said, at the beginning of the season, our goal was to go to the playoffs. So here's what's going to happen. They just won the toss. They, they want the ball. You know what we're going to do? We're going to hold them. And then we're going to get the ball. We're going to score a touchdown. And we're going to win by more than four points. And we're going to the playoffs next week. And that's exactly what happened. <laughs> 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 that play, um, for about two weeks, made Coach Herbert Lee one of the most famous people in football. And people from... College and, and pros talked about it for a couple of weeks. I went back to work that day, and a couple of my friends had seen it. We said, man, this was Tishy Mingo, this little school up there north of East Mississippi. All this happened. Now let me fast forward to 19. Kathy, I think it was around 1994, but I'm not positive. I was a program director and senior faculty member at Etiwamba Community College. I taught respiratory therapy. Kathy Haynes was one of my colleagues. And she uh, called me one day and said, I need you to go with me to see a patient. And so she rode with, I rode with her. And um, she told me this guy was on a ventilator, and that's why she was being seen by a respiratory therapist, and she had to change out his trach tube. And so she'd like to have somebody with her. When we arrived, I met the patient's wife, Linda. The house was immaculate. The patient was well-groomed and well-nourished, and his wife, Linda, was the reason. She was a perfect, wonderful caregiver. 
His tracheostomy was the cleanest I'd ever seen. Now, you have to be a respiratory therapist to appreciate that. Uh, uh, and so uh, we marveled at how well he looked and how clean he looked and, and that kind of thing. Uh, that he had uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, the only muscle that he could move was his eyes. Eyes up meant something. Eyes down meant something. Eyes to the left meant something else. They had worked out a code. We sat there, their husband bedside, and thus began one of the most incredible conversations I'd ever had in my life. I can't explain it to you, and Kathy probably can't either, but uh, this patient, this man, was part of our conversation. He couldn't move, he couldn't talk, and Linda would say, dear, would you like me to tell Harold the story about, or do you need this? And he would move his eyes back and forth. That's all he could do is move his eyes. And um, it was remarkable. They had worked out, I mean, if there was ever a situation or example where two people, two married people were one flesh, that was it. Linda made lunch. I think it was peas and cornbread, Kathy. After lunch, Linda showed me the pictures of her four children, and she pointed to Lori Ann's picture. She had been a senior in high school and a cheerleader, and she was killed in a car wreck. And this is what Linda said. She said, I was in the car too. I was in ICU for a week in a coma and had several broken bones. When I finally woke up, it was my husband who had to tell me what had happened to Lori Ann. While I was in the hospital, he had to bury our daughter. He worked full time while raising our other three children, taking care of the house and helping me through months of rehab. He never once complained or asked why. His faith in God was unwavering. That man lying in there unable to move a muscle is still the strongest man I've ever met. On the way home, I was kind of overcome after we got back to, to Tupelo. I got in my car and headed home, and uh, I, I got a little emotion. I, I, I was kind of overcome, and it was uh, my heart was kind of torn in two directions, and I describe it this way. Joy for having met such a wonderful couple, seeing their love for God and their love for one another, and seeing what two people becoming one flesh really meant. But there was... Joy, there was also despair, despair at the realization that, that I wasn't half the man Coach Herbert was. My lack of courage and face was staring me in the face. I think that was the response from most people who had visited the Herberts. Inspiration, yet at the same time, a sense of inadequacy. Now fast forward 27 years. From 1989 to 2012, I was in Heather Palmer, raise your hand again, Heather, I was in my office, and we were talking football. And I said, you know, once a long time ago, there was this play, and I said, it was incredible. And, I, and she's just nodding her head and listening to me, and I'm telling the play. She said, Harry, you know I'm from Tishomingo. And I said, no. She said, I, I knew this man. I said, you're kidding and I said, that, that's crazy. She said, did you know that uh, he had Lou Gehrig's disease and that his daughter was killed in a car wreck? And I said, was her name Linda? And was his, her, I mean, was the mother Linda and the daughter Lori Ann? She said, yeah. I said, I know this guy. I know this guy. I treated him years and years ago, Kathy. I treated him years and years ago um, when he was on a ventilator. And so we made that connection, and then she said, well, you know, there's a book out about it. And I said, there's a book? <laughs> I mean, I was just overcome. There's a book? And so she let me borrow her book, and I read it with just great interest. And so you've heard now about the play. You've heard a little bit about 1A football and what it was like. Now I want to talk a little bit about his faith. In 1985, I'm going to go back in time a little bit, the team had beaten their arch rival and were now the bus of hungry football players were on their way to McDonald's in Corinth for a late supper, supper before returning to Tishomingo. Herbert's wife Nancy and their three daughters and a friend drove on ahead of the bus. Lori Ann was driving the car and they were ahead of the bus. They came over a hill and they saw the blue lights. Coach Herbert walked down to check it out. 
Nancy had already been picked up by the ambulance, head injury, several broken bones, and their daughter, Lori Ann, and another girl were dead. And one of the coaches gave this uh, quote uh, about what had happened. He said, we came over the hill and Coach Herbert was driving. He pulled over and said, I'm going to go down and see what happened. He came back, it's my family. We got off the bus and prayed. After the prayer, he said, I'm at peace now. I don't know how he could have said it, but he said it. Another fellow who was, I believe, the deacon of their church at the time, he said at the hospital after the wreck, a large group of family and friends had gathered at the hospital. They, we were going to have a prayer for the family, and I was going to lead it when Coach Herbert said, fellas, I feel like I need to pray. When he prayed, the part I remember so well, he said, dear God, thank you for not taking all my family today. Thank you for your goodness and your kindness. And in the midst of this tragedy, David Herbert was praying and praising God. I'll never forget being in that room with that man. I don't know if I could ever have been that strong. What I didn't realize when I watched years ago that play uh, on NFL Today, I hadn't been paying attention to the backstory. When I heard him say the play in Tishomingo, that's when I looked at the TV. But I didn't see the front part. The front part of the story was that um, Coach Herbert was sitting on a flatbed truck when he called that play and coached that game. He was in a motorized wheelchair on the back of a flatbed pickup truck, and that's how he coached that last game. He'd been sick all year and had got sicker and sicker and sicker. Um, now fast forward 17 years to 2005, the year David Lee Herbert died. The doctors told us he'd only live about five years and we've had him for 18. Linda Herbert, David's Lee widow, told us he was a strong, strong man. And Linda Herbert was a strong, strong woman. This is far, far more than a football story. This is a love story. Following the 1988 school year, Linda Herbert quit her job to care for her husband whose health deteriorated rapidly and cruelly. She cared for him at home around the clock, five years in Tishomingo and for the last 12 in Carrollton where they were surrounded by more family. Friends talk about how hard I worked, but it wasn't like a job. I didn't get tired, Linda Herbert told me. I loved him that much. He loved me that much too. We would have done the same for each other. ALS is the cruelest of diseases. The mind is sharp while the body loses function, organ by organ. David Lee Herbert first needed to ventilate or breathe in 1989. He still loved his football, which he watched at every opportunity on TV. His wife would clip newspaper magazine articles about the sport and arrange them so he could see and eat, read them easily. For years, the only way David Lee Herbert could communicate was by blinking his eyes, and then those facial muscles began to fail him. Yet, Linda Herbert still managed. The book goes on to say, you want to know what love is? This is love. I was with him so much I could read his mind, Linda Herbert said. Usually I knew he was want what he was wanting, and I could look at him and tell what he wanted and needed. It's interesting, one of the other quotes in the book, uh, uh, his sister came by to visit, and she came over and sat down on the bed. And she said, he kept looking over at Linda and blinking his eyes and kind of going different ways. She said, I never could understand what they were saying, but they were, he was talking to his wife. And uh, she had to go through a list of things. Well, do you want this? Do you want that? Is it this? And he'd blink his eyes and say, okay, you must mean this. As it turned out, she said, oh, you're sitting on Herbert's leg. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she said, I was, and so I scooted and moved out of the way. That's, um, that's how well they were able to communicate. Yes, he had to remind me one time, just because he couldn't raise it, maybe he couldn't do that. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's kind of a side note. <clears throat> this disease, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, it attacks the sensory nerves. Uh, oh, oh, excuse me, I had it backwards. It attacks, it attacks the motor nerves, so you're not able to move, but the sensory nerves are still intact, so they can feel it. They just can't move. And so all of their 
their senses are still intact, which makes it so, so cruel. Um, as a matter of fact, ALS is the cruelest of diseases. The mind remains sharp while the body loses function, organ by organ. Well, Linda Herbert died in 2019 of lung disease nearly 14 years after her husband's death. Her son Dave said this, Mama was a hero too, says David Herbert, <clears throat> who now lives in Florence. What she did behind the scenes all those years, people wouldn't believe. Now I'm going to read a quote from the book about another person that I consider a hero. In 1994, David Lee and Linda decided to move back to Carroll County home they had kept through the years. There, Linda could have easier access to family who could help with David Lee. After Stacy and Holly uh, graduated just with the children from Tishomingo County High School, the Herberts said goodbye to that community that had been so good to their family. Gracious help from Herbert's extended community continued even as David Lee's battle changed venues. After Coach Herbert's tracheostomy had been placed in him uh, because he was on the ventilator full time, Kathy Haynes, it says Kathy Haynes the nurse, Kathy Haynes is the respiratory therapist, so Al, I need to call him when I'm going to say that. So I'm going to read it. Kathy Haynes, the respiratory therapist from North Mississippi Medical Center, Tupelo, had helped the Herbert set up the ventilator in their tissue and go home in her part-time role with the health services company. Tishonego County was her company service area, so she visited their Tishonego home for the remainder of their time there, changing his straight out me out every three months. However, when the Herberts moved back to Carroll County, they also moved outside her service area. She wouldn't see the family again until they showed up at the emergency room in Tupelo several months later to have David Lee's tube changed. The trip took a toll on the family. You can't imagine what it would be like to put a patient in his condition and go from Carrollton County all the way to Tupelo in the ambulance and bang it around. It, it was really, really hard on him. Well, Kathy saw him there, and she decided to do something about it. The tracheostomy tube needed to be traded out periodically. He had come back to our hospital and had to change in the ER. This is Kathy talking. It was tough making the trip. It was just so uncomfortable, and we had been doing it at the Tishomingo. At that time, I told him, I won't make you go through that again. I will come to your house in Carrollton and change it out off-duty as a lay person. Otherwise, we would have had to go to Jackson or Tupelo to have it changed out. They were just so excited that I was willing to do that. That ended up being many, many years. Linda finally remembered coming to know Haynes through her regular care. Linda recalled she was coming from Halka, a two and a half hour drive. Sometimes her husband or somebody else would come with her. So I tried to have a good supper for them, and that's how I ended up getting to go with Kathy, getting to go. Uh, but that's what it did. I, I, I was able to go, and she had supper. Uh, for her part, Kathy became an honorary member of the Herbert family. Over the next decade, she continued to drive from Halka to Carrollton several times annually. She shared her life with the Herberts, introducing them to whichever friend or family member she brought along for the ride. However, Linda and Dave were more interested in her life. Kathy says this then, my husband was a basketball coach and assistant football coach and my kids were playing football. They would follow all of that. Linda would have a meal made for me and, and let me tell you the lady's a good cook. We would go through the process and I would change out his breathing tube for him. That was our routine. I worked full time, and by the time I drove down there and spent about an hour, an hour and a half with them, it took me five or six hours. Sometimes I was thinking how that was a chore, but I would walk into that house and they would make me forget all my troubles. I always came away from there feeling so blessed. They had so much, uh, they had so much of them over the years, and they just kept going. And so, that's all for you, Kathy. This was an absolute uh, remarkable family, and I want to, um, you know, just mention just a couple other things. Um, I want to mention Heather. I've already mentioned Heather that she kind of, after we had that conversation my, in my office, and I realized that I, I had actually knew this man, but I didn't know he was the man that did the play. 
that I had seen on TV. And then it was uh, Heather that gave me the book. And I just found out today, talking to Heather, the other little gir girl that was killed in the car, she was um, in fourth grade. She was uh, nine years old, nine years old. And her name was Kimberly Whitlock. And she was Heather's best friend in, in school. And so uh, I think it was your grandmother that had the breaking news to you. Is that right? Yeah. And so, um, y'all, we all get teary. Every, anybody that knew that family, we all get uh, teary-eyed when we think about it. I'd only met the man a couple of times, but it was just incredible. And in closing, Herbert, who died July 16th, at age 63, was a small-town Mississippi football coach who made international news for a stroke of coaching genius in November 1988. Some fans surely will remember. At first, they wouldn't do it. This is Coach Herbert talking. At first, they wouldn't do it, Dave Herbert said. They didn't understand. We got penalized twice for delay of game before I could convince them to do it. Naturally, Tishomingo scored in overtime, and therefore that's the first playing for overtime, um, um, and, and won the game 22-16. to 16. They earned the district title, made the playoffs. David Lee Herbert became, for at least one week, one of the most celebrated coaches in all of football. I really think David Lee coached, this is his wife Linda talking, I really think David Lee coached that last year because it was Dave's senior year. It was getting hard for him to coach. We had, I had to quit teaching. He didn't know how much time he had left, so he wanted to finish out the season. He was in a motorized wheelchair on a flatbed pickup truck, and that's how he coached the game. Now I want to read pages 238. Let me find just a couple more quotes here. And this is Kathy Haynes again, remembered another time when David Lee struggled to communicate what was on his mind. A lot of times Linda would um, auto-figure out what he was saying. One time it took him a really long time. She just kept on and on, and it was just like challenging trying to figure out what it was and what he was trying to say. Well, he was trying to say, to ask if my husband wanted his football playbook. Though the plays in Coach Herbert's uh, playbook had been successful throughout his career, the one that was the most famous for it was not found in the book. Haynes remembered hearing about the wrong way play on Paul Harvey's show, but didn't realize until well into her career and care for Dave Lee that her special patient was the one who had gained international fame for it. So Kathy was like me. It was after the fact that she discovered that he was the guy. Every... Friday night during the fall, a visitor to the Herbert's home, and visitors were always welcome, would find Coach Herbert watching Friday Night Fever. Will Colmeyer did not know until recently that the little football show he had once fought so vigorously for was part of Coach Herbert's weekly routine. <laughs> well, as I mentioned, um, he died at 63. And um, David Lee Herbert was inducted into the Mississippi o Association of Coaches Hall of Fame in 1989. A book, Playing Overtime, the David Lee Herbert uh, story, was authored by Al Ainsworth and published in 2019 with the Ford by Rick Cleveland. I encourage you to read this book. Even though I've told you the story, there are so many stories. There's so many stories in here. And I knew the outcome before I read the book, and it didn't change my, my love for the book and my love for that remarkable man and his wife. Um, so um, if you got a question, I might be able to answer it. And if I can't, maybe Kathy or, or Heather might. Anything? Okay, then. Well, thank you all for your time.